During the late 90s and early 2000s, I was obsessed with three different monster raising franchises, and the one I held dearest just so happens to be one that did not become a huge breakout success. But hey, the bronze medal in my heart failed more miserably, so it made the runner-up look like a huge success in comparison. This is what we call the Sega Saturn effect. So even though Suezo from Monster Rancher didn't become a household name, Agumon kind of did for a few minutes there. He was a star in quite a few games based off a successful virtual pet line, and some of them even left Japan. The first to cross these oceans was Digimon World, a game that I sunk an inordinate amount of time into as a young child, which is why I still enjoy it now since it is not a newcomer friendly game and at times it feels frankly cruel, but that doesn't matter since it was Digimon and I got to see them in beautiful 3D models. These were more technologically advanced than the virtual pet I had in my pocket, obviously. This 1999 adventure, not to be confused with Digimon Adventure, the movie, or the TV series, both from 1999 sees us playing as a regular human kid in the real world, but he's instantly sucked into his virtual pet and sent on a quest to save File Island. Unbeknownst to me as a young child, this is basically the initial plot of the successful manga which was the first story in the franchise. They stuck to what they knew, and since this game predated the movie or anime, it was probably the wisest choice since what else would you base a story on with these virtual pets? This was a new franchise trying to break in through to other mediums, and not just be a simple toy children would get bored of once we as a society learned how to manufacture those affordable robot dog things. The first game is a weird mix of genres, basically feels like a much more fleshed out virtual pet, complete with training, feeding, and bathroom breaks. But it's also an adventure game where we scour a huge map of pre-rendered tiles and build up a city by recruiting more Digimon while also getting into fights with other Digimon, and these are things you barely control. You're just their trainer and they do their own automated actions, and the best you can do is give them very basic tactics if they have a high brain stat. Be prepared for them to die a lot. It was heartbreaking, but at this point I was used to my Digimon dying every few days, even if I was more attached to these 3D representations. And since this is the very early state of the franchise, Digimon will often die of old age in their champion form, and the ultimate stage is a rarity that I as a kid almost never saw. This game liked making kids sad, but I couldn't get enough of it since it was addictive and unlike anything I had ever seen. I mean, it was a game where I had digital poop litter everything and I couldn't clean it unless I had a disgusting poop eating Digimon. Though that isn't a shame Numemon, he is my friend and I will always defend him. Unfortunately for child me, this game was an isolated experience, because even its sequels wouldn't carry this weird mix of styles. Here in Australia we did not get Digimon World 2, so the first game that I felt betrayed by was the terribly named Digimon World 2003. And okay, I now know it's a good game, it's great and it's pixel art is frankly unmatched. Look at it! But as a child, I couldn't get into it because I felt bitter that they didn't do more of what the first game did. I wanted more of that and I did not want any kind of different take on the Digimon franchise. But this would unfortunately keep continuing. More Digimon games came out, and they were mostly turn-based JRPGs, but we also had fighting games, games based off a trading card game, weird hack and slashes, and basically everything else that wasn't more Digimon World 1 even if they wore its name. I like to think I've matured since I was 9 years old, and I now love a lot of Digimon games, so I, I guess I haven't really matured much. Games like the Cyber Sleuth Duology are easy recommendations, and Digimon Survive was a masterpiece of writing and my favourite game of the year. Granted, I didn't play many games from that year, but Digimon World and the two other games that directly follow its footsteps are what Digimon games are to me at their peak even if the actual gameplay is often tedious and hard to recommend. So let me attempt to recommend it, but keep in mind when I describe all this, it is fun, it just doesn't sound fun. Please believe me. The second Digimon World type game is actually the fifth Digimon World game, except in the west where I think it would be the ninth or maybe tenth, since there were a lot of other games that were renamed to Digimon World here for brand recognition, including the dual release Dusk and Dawn games. So the second or fifth or ninth or whatever Digimon World game 
is just called Digimon World Redigitized, since that's a lot less confusing than numbering it. This was made for the PSP in 2012, but was only released in Japan, so a lot of people outside of Japan know nothing about it. This PSP game was basically what Kid Me wanted, but by the time it came out, I was 18 and I was too busy playing serious games for serious gamers. This game would later get a fan translation patch and a 2013 version for 3DS that is so much better it basically makes the original release useless nowadays. But hey, it's a good game, I promise, and it really does feel like a link between the Digimon world of my youth and the most modern Digimon world game we have. The newest of these is Digimon World Next Order, a 2016 game that was originally exclusive to Sony's handheld, the PlayStation Vita. And much like its predecessor, the following year it was given a re-release on a system people owned, so that version is so much better it basically made the original obsolete. But I'm not going to cover a PS4 game. The Vita is the only handheld way to play this game. Or it was. Bandai Namco have a re-releasing on the Switch very soon, so the Vita got robbed of another handheld exclusive. They just got Cyber Sleuthed. The upcoming Switch version even adds a run button, so this first release is even less worth your time now, and that's not even counting the list of features the PlayStation 4 version added, like a harder difficulty, more Digimon to recruit, and all these other things that make me sad since I'm playing the lesser version. Oh well because even a lesser version of this game is still good. But some of its largest problems have been solved now through re-releases. Just pretend my version looks better. For starters, I have to get into the weird backstory with this version. The Vita release was only released in Asian territories, and like I said, it wasn't until the PlayStation 4 release a year later that the full world had access to it. But hidden inside the data of Next Order on Vita is an English translation, and it's basically all translated, but for some reason it wasn't implemented into the game. Probably because they knew the market would be so small that it wasn't worth it, and they probably knew that they were planning an international console version that would actually be profitable. It wasn't uncommon for Vita games to get an Asian English release. These were primarily for markets like Hong Kong or Singapore, and sometimes it's the only way to get these games physically in English, and other times it isn't, but hey, it was $10 cheaper on eBay, so why not get this version? The Asian English exclusive releases still happen now on more successful systems like the Switch. But this wasn't that. The English data was there, but it wasn't implemented. It may have originally planned to be an Asian English release, but then things changed later in development, but the work here is all done, and that's the important bit. And I mean done! This is a full translation including all the menus and text, so thanks to the kinds of people who obsess over Sony's best failure even more than me, they were able to implement this fully translated localized script into the original Vita game with some slight modding. But while the script itself is final, the formatting isn't, and that's really the only issue with it. The text doesn't fit the boxes properly, and every battle has an actix menu, and no, that isn't me cropping the footage, it's just like that. Also, this game's DLC wasn't really translated, though some small pieces are. A character can speak to me and I won't understand it, but then I'll check the digi mail menu and it will translate the task for me. Sometimes, other times it won't. But it's worth noting that this is still an official localization, even if it looks like a fan translation in terms of its presentation. But fear not, we have words like Myotismon, Gatomon, and forms like Rookie and Champion, which fan translations will never touch. The script quality and terminology all feel official from localizers, even if the presentation clearly doesn't resemble what you'd see in a commercial release. But that's enough about the bits that aren't the game. When we open up the game, we're instantly presented with a Unity Engine logo, which is fine, but if I was a complete hack who knew nothing about game design, this is where I would start my rant about Unity and use that as a scapegoat for any elements of the game that don't run well. Once we start a new file, we find out we're a human who is a Digimon virtual pet battler, and we're transported to the digital world to save it, you know, for plot of a manga, and the first world game. And it's also the plot of the PSP and 3DS title, which I basically skipped over for this video's sake. Say what you will about the genre inconsistent Digimon World sequels of the early 2000s, but at least they had more going on in terms of unique plots. But I also won't cut them any slack, because my boy Gilmon would never be a cop. 
This is more than just a recycle, because this plot is a direct sequel of sorts to the first game. The protagonist of that game has grown into a man, and while it barely matters, that just makes my aging heart happy. I understand what that is, that's a reference for me! It would be easy to say that this game is a bit been there done that, but once we get out Digimon, two things are immediately different and these ripple exponentially to give this game a very unique feeling compared to its predecessors. The most obvious of these is that we have two Digimon at once. This is a pretty surface level change at first and it doesn't change much of a basic strategy, since to spoil it, the combat in these games is barely in your control. But it does add slightly more depth to the combat encounters on its own, since sorry to get a bit too scientific for you, but two sets of stats is more than one set. And then we have the other change, which seems small at first, but it really does show the grander mission statement of the sequel. We get to choose our two starter Digimon from a selection of eggs, and it tells us exactly what hatches from those. Now let's rewind. The first world game only gave you an initial choice between an Agumon and Gabumon. The second game in this style only gave you an Agumon with cursed artwork accompanying him. But here we get a large smorgasbord to choose from, and they're all labelled so you know exactly what you're getting. And the labelling doesn't end here. Whenever you affect a Digimon's potential evolution, a message comes up on screen to let you know. This game doesn't want to leave anything up to guesswork. It's like a game with its own built-in guide taking over the screen, and I can see why this is something many would want. The first world game is often criticised for feeling too cryptic, and for never giving you the Digimon you actually want. And you could be one mistake from getting either a Greymon or a Numamon, because of how unforgiving the behind the scenes metrics were. But to me, this is an overcorrection. Everything is explained to the point there are no surprises, I already knew my Gabumon would become a Garurumon long before the transformation occurred. I liked the constant surprises and frankly many disappointing moments of the first game, so this personally bothers me. But instead of saying they ruined things, I'll admit this is a change I am not personally a fan of, but it was probably the wise thing to do since there was so much backlash towards the original system, and this is a much more welcoming game. I'd give in to peer pressure too if I was making a sequel, I understand. But I earlier said this feels like a mission statement, and that's because it extends further beyond just knowing what you're getting. It feels like every mechanic was simplified here, and this is a situation where any of these individually would be great, but it's the total combination of these that weakens the game for me. Digimon can't be praised or scolded whenever you feel like it, only when a prompt comes up. You can save the game anywhere, which does make sense for a portable system, but it also does remove the stress since scumming is now a possibility. Battles pause whenever you bring out items. Digimon can rest anywhere when fatigued, and also money is never an issue and it's so easy to load up on portable toilets and autopilot items, no stress ever occurs here. I never had to see my Digimon defecate outside a toilet, which was half the game for first time players of the original. Like I said, these are fine changes individually, but it's the combination that makes it feel like all the challenge was removed here. And trust me, it doesn't end there since you actually get the ability to control paddles now with an option to manually select attacks at the cost of points built up during the rest of the automatic battles. And this isn't tied to any kind of brain stat, so expect to wreck everything all the time. It might sound like I'm a downer on this game, but I do still love it. I just want everything laid out in advance since this is always a great formula, even if it's not ideal for me personally in this game. They just needed to round down the edges of the first game, but instead they took out all the edges entirely. But on the upside, this is the most accessible game in the series to newcomers, and I'd probably have preferred this as a young child instead of the torturous game that I first played. But that's enough comparing and contrasting. Fun fact, but most people in the world have not played Digimon World for PlayStation, so this has all been kinda pointless. What is this game actually like in a vacuum with no expectations against it? Plus I don't want to have to compare it to the middle game for PSP and 3DS, so that's a whole other video a year from now when I subject you to Digimon content next. Things in next order start off humbly with our two Digimon friends and a small village to rest and train in. The training here is done at a gym and it's so quick and easy, and best of all, we get the obvious utility of being able to train two Digimon at different stats at the same time. 
For the few of you who didn't believe I'd completely stop comparisons to the first game, you were right. I will compare it again and say this is a massive improvement over the debut game's gym system. We get a timing minigame for each training session, and this is a simple time waster, but it makes me feel like I'm not just on autopilot, and the amount and variety of rewards here is based on a series of factors the game outright tells you when selecting these workouts. It's just a shame that working out in Digimon World gyms is usually something you want to avoid when you can help it, and given how Next Order re-implemented its reincarnation system, this much more robust and fun gym is basically neglected almost entirely. And this is because of all the many systems in play. The gym fatigues Digimon, which isn't good for them. Resting fixes that, but then you're just wasting time, which is a limited resource, since your digital partners will die of old age. And enemies in the overworld also increase stats without the dire side effects if you can handle them. But at the start, you'll have just little baby Digimon who won't survive in the wild, so this is a good place to start off. Other important staples are introduced here. We have toilets, which are mandatory for your pals, and the meat fields for growing meat, a staple in most Digimon diets. More will be added as the town grows in size, and in a touch I like, the city does change its appearance dramatically later on to signify this. Once your Digimon are prepared to explore a little, we're gifted with this beautiful open expanse, and I mean this by the Vita standards. I know this is very limited overall, but since the first game was just pre-granted backgrounds that covered very little space, and new tiles had to be loaded in constantly, this is a beautiful expanse. It's just a shame that this standard grassy plains area is going to be the game's most open environment. Later, much prettier and surprising biomes will have funneling you through tight pathways, where it takes much longer to get to any area than it should, because of the awkward pathing. And sometimes the game still struggles to render as much as it does, with the ice area being a great example. But hey, I love all the zones here, even if some aren't the best to actually traverse. Look at this one, it has neon lights and a giant Toyagumon. How can I not love it? While out and about, Digimon's needs will become very apparent. They let you know when it's time to feed them, or when it's time to let their bowels be emptied, and this time it's with very repetitive phrases in English text, in addition to the iconic poop icon that I can't live without in this series. Feeding is done for a new menu where the Digimon come to you and stand there waiting for some kind of input from you, and you give them items to satiate their needs. It's nice, though in tighter areas Digimon can get stuck trying to walk to you, which is something I'm undecided on since I don't know if it's a problem or if it's just funny. While in this menu, or the more convenient pause menu, we can see their important mood bars and also how they feel about each other. And either in this menu with a portable toilet item, or at the weirdly gendered public toilets, which is just odd since Digimon are gender fluid and non-binary icons. These guys do their business, and well, it's efficient. But it's not as funny as the pooping animation of before. Unfortunately for me, the bulk of the actual gameplay experience shows itself here. We have these glowing circle icons, and when you go to them you're given the opportunity to harvest materials. This will all be for upgrading buildings in town, which is a prerequisite for quite a few Digimon to be recruited. This is the aim of the game. Maybe I'm just wired differently than everyone else, but tedious and slow resource harvesting isn't something I really enjoy in games, and it's no different here. If I wanted to just explore a map and do nothing fun, I'd be playing Dragon Quest Treasures. That was a joke, I do like the game, I think. But they're cut from the same cloth. A mechanic I don't like in games is shackled to a series I love with cute little monster friends, so it's got me by the throat and I have to endure it. I feel like there are ways you could improve it here, like a simple automatic harvesting button whenever we walk close to these materials, or even just speeding up how long it takes to harvest them, but instead we have the system we do have and I don't enjoy it. But the end result of this, where we upgrade pre-existing buildings and services, is a mechanic I love and it's an obvious fit for the series. I just wish it was handled better than it was, because I do not want to remove this entire facet here. But with this we can upgrade the farm to have more meat fields, or allow more items to be in existing shops, or allow a warehouse to store more items, just to name a few modifications. 
and it also means, in theory, new Digimon Weave Recruit won't solve redundant roles like these upgrades. But there's still quite a few filler ones here, and it's even worse on the original Vita release. But regardless of their productivity, the town blossoms, and with the constant onslaught of money you receive, everything is trivialized with items and resources available. But I can't be mad. Look at these guys here. We have a talking Gomamon for God's sake. Plus they even hid the music player here as part of the museum section of town, and that's just precious, even if it is realistically a large inconvenience to people. The biggest downside of the Vita version shows itself here in the town recruitment side. The amount of Digimon in your town required to progress and even beat the game is tiny compared to the international versions that bumped up the numbers. You only need a prosperity ranking of 40 here, whereas it's 100 on consoles. This would be like if Mario 64 had roughly the same number of stars as it already does, but in its first release you only needed 25 or so to beat the game. Before someone in the comments says something clever, yes I know speedruns do in fact exist. Now, this doesn't really matter to the kinds of people that go in wanting to complete or at least nearly complete this game, but I could see a lot of people getting to the credits and thinking they're done with it, and then they're missing most of the actual gameplay here. Stuff that is main game for most was relegated to post game for me, since I didn't know when things would end and I didn't know how to pace things better. I finished the game with a prosperity ranking of 63. I was taking my time, but even then I still did comparatively rush it. The whole battlefield conflict was basically something I didn't even get involved in until post game, and it would be a shame if I missed out on that. This is one of the most interesting parts of the world here. It's easy to see why this was corrected. I can't bear to imagine a timeline where I actually did not help Leomon. But to give this Vita version a positive, even if a Switch or Steam Deck version will make this less special going forward, this really does feel like a game built for pick up and play, small visits from time to time. And that's probably why it took me so long to get this all done. I started this game back in May last year. Now I could have sat on the couch and dedicated the better parts of my weekends to this to blaze on through. I sure did that with the first world game many times, but that lent itself much better to longer sessions with very limited saving and a much steeper difficulty. But Next Order is a game that feels like it was custom made for Sony's little failure. Which is why it's kind of a shame that everyone I knew who played this did so with the admittedly more feature filled and prettier release that is tethered to your TV. Now this is just my perspective, but when I view it as a game to play in small bursts, the super easy difficulty, constant signposting, and ability to save anywhere go from negatives to things I'm really happy with. And that's just cause the actual core, even if it's riddled with a lot of issues I don't care for, is so fun and unique outside of its siblings. And having it on the go is really good. We can traverse these worlds with Digimon in tow, constantly stay on top of them to make sure they evolve into what we want, do quests which are frankly boilerplate and underwhelming but who cares, I have a puppy following me. And we get into fights including more fun boss fights that are always climactic and give a larger emphasis on the story here and our cast of human friends. One of them is even a cautionary tale since he mistreated his Digimon so it evolved wrong and became violent, but at least we had the Digimon survive. And as is the case in these games, every other character is immortal but your Digimon age rapidly, like they're the protagonist of Fable or something. In their final moments, they slow down and can't keep up with your pace, and it's kind of sad. But get used to your digital pals dying and becoming reincarnated, but at least it's not as often as the first game. Especially with the help of trainer skills that you can equip, which frankly snap what is ever left of the difficulty into smaller pieces. Digimon inherit a lot more skills now when they're reborn, and you can have things like Digimon heal whenever they're out of battle, or for more boring players you can make it so you more successfully catch fish whenever you go fishing. But without a rumble here on the Vita, fishing is soulless. Now I know why I got poured as a console. I'm definitely double dipping for the HD rumble fishing. Plus this game lets me wanting a way to run, and that's well worth the price of me double dipping for the Switch or PC. These sections of world can be big, but more importantly, like I said earlier, they're convoluted and take forever to traverse. It'll feel like days of your life pass as you walk from end to end, and here those days jarringly switch between day, dusk, and night 
at the exact minute they're meant to. I'd say that's a funny reference to this being the digital world, but even the first game had smoother time of day changes. Also that had a more stylish clock interface, but here we traded the cute and distinct one for something more boring and practical. It's Majora's Mask 3D all over again. Give me back my silly little clock. The zones here really do feel artificial, but not in a good or fitting way. I love how they merge the natural and the technological together. And even with the Vita's low specs, I found all these locations beautiful. Though it is worth noting my optometrist says I am well overdue for an eye test. And before I complain, I do just want to give a huge compliment to the fact that these unique environmental biomes can make your Digimon sick if it doesn't appeal to them. Does this big furry guy look like he wants to be in a volcano? He doesn't. And forcing your team through these areas adds a lot of tension, since you know you can't dawdle. And it really does help these not feel like just backdrops. To your Digimon at least, these are real places they love and hate. My problem arises from the jarring change between these over-the-top biomes. And there should be more between these locales. Instead of a natural transition from one location to another, we just go through a loading screen and we instantly go from, say, a sunny field to a desert storm, or to an almost overcast and dark coastal region. It's just like flicking a switch, it feels really out of place. The thematically cool and perpetually dark locations really mess this up the most. Even if I love the look of a pirate ship or a neon graveyard or a snowstorm blasted temple, these are all amazing on their own. It's just they feel really out of place, and it doesn't help that they were the least fun or open areas to navigate. But at the end of the day, I at least didn't get lost or confused, which the first game is very guilty of. So these distinct locales, with at times small trails that we have to follow, do have their upsides. But the poor draw distance on this particular Vita release did result in a lot of occasions where I couldn't find particular NPCs in the environment because they just didn't render in, and the super zoomed in minimap did not help at all. Yet for all these faults, both technical because of a weaker hardware, or design wise because I didn't love the direction they went in, I still loved my time with this third, and most importantly, most accessible of the Digimon World type games. It's a feedback loop where I'm constantly rewarded with praise, and in this case I never have to be stressed. Sure, it never hits the high as I'd want to, but it never drops below a pretty consistent level of fun. All the objectives are simple point A to B affairs that usually end with punching an opponent a lot, but they're sprinkled across the map so often during the intended play that I always have something to do, and the few longer challenges are always helpfully laid out in the digi mail system, so unless you hate reading you'll always remember the countless objectives you have. These are usually held up by cute writing for these scenarios. They really brought these guys to life, even when they're just an animated skeleton. And your Digimon feel more lifelike too, since they can be very disobedient little guys. Especially when they're immature in training or rookie stages. I know that on an intellectual level, my Digimon complaining about the food I just gave him is a nuisance to most. But I don't care, that's what I'm here for. I just want to have more fun antics with this little guy, and then see him die. It's less morbid than it sounds. The story is more involved than it had to be, and even though it's never particularly great, I'll never forget the characters or the basic beats of the story. Just uh, don't ask me for specifics, because yeah, it's not that memorable. But its inclusion was a nice wrinkle to everything which further escalated the stakes. It never got to the point of being unbearable or dragging on too long, so hey, that's something. Low bar, I know, but I was sufficiently entertained by the story for this children's game, which even by the series standards isn't particularly high. I'm not here for a story, but they still gave me one that was decent enough. I'm here to run around the fields, make a town more prosperous, and see digital monsters beat each other up, and I was never disappointed outside the difficulty. And to add on to that, the attacks are way more stylish than before, and each Digimon has their own special signature attack, which plays a short animated clip each time it's used. Seeing these was a nice incentive to broaden my roster of Digimon, and it was great fan service to some of these monsters I have known for over two decades. Status afflictions are pretty common, 
but they never ruin your day here like they used to. And the one that reduced Digimon to a small representation of their original virtual pet forms is back now, and now they're colourful. And while I prefer the more faithful one at before, these ones are all just so special and I love seeing all these monsters get crammed into such a simple design. Also, since we have two guys at all times, we can do a temporary fusion which is just an I win button for that fight. It'd be weird if it wasn't here, but it's just really extra. Like, and it's a nice clip to play for your trailer, but I have better things to do than this. Okay, well, I don't, but even then I still don't care for it. Analytically, I could complain a lot about this, but it's a comfort game. This video kept being delayed because I just wanted to keep playing it longer and longer, and I won't stop playing when this video is done, even if I've got all the footage I could possibly need. This isn't my favourite game in the style, but it's the one I come back to over and over again for small visits. And if me playing this game over the course of about half a year isn't enough of a testament, I don't know what is. And the long haul is worth it, because the game has individual seasons with its own calendar system, and the town gets to celebrate all these. Look, there's decorations here. This is just cozy and friendly. The game could be literally unplayable with buttons that didn't work half the time, and I'd still recommend it just for the coziness. I get to twiddle my thumbs and rotate the camera to see all these beautiful vistas, and Digimon games having camera control is still quite a novelty. We're a bit behind the times, but just let me enjoy this moment, please. Also, you get to fight some giant forms of regular Digimon, and that includes fighting a giant baby. I know that sounds bad, but I love Bodomon, and look how big he is! How can you not love this? Ultimately, this is a really fun game, and I just chose to play the worst version of it because that's just what I'm like. And that isn't changing because the next video will be about Donkey Kong Country for the Game Boy Color. Look, it has a longer version of Winky's Walkway.